All right. So, all right. So, look, this is what I wanted to show you guys. Yeah. I don't want to see that funny orange face right now. All right. So, yeah. all right. So, let's do this super quick because I want to get into our ethical theories. But I, I, let's do this super quick because I want to get back into our ethical theory. Hey, listen up. But this has to do, I think, has a direct parallel to utilitarianism because what did we say utilitarianism? One of the because remember, on the surface, this sounds good, right? The greatest pleasure for the greatest folk, or the greatest amount, right? But what was one of the serious drawbacks of that? Remember, there was like eight that we listed. But what was one of the first and most serious? That it couldn't ever protect or validate what? The interests and or slash rights of who? Of those in what? The minorities, right? Because they weren't as important to the majority. To the majority, right? Now... You'll hear a lot of stuff about the Electoral College, right? Lots of stuff about the Electoral College, how we need to get rid of it, and all that kind of stuff. What was the point of the Electoral College, and still is the point? Uh, the point of the Electoral College was to give more sway to population, dense areas. Well, well, no, it was supposed to protect against the tyranny of the majority, right? Because if we have a, we don't have a pure democracy, democracy in this country. We have a republic, right? Because... People say, well, we want a pure democracy, but again, like utilitarianism, what can a pure democracy never do? A pure democracy, what can it never do? It can never guarantee that what? The minority view right, is heard, ever. Because if constantly the majority just constantly says, this is the way we want it, then you can have a tyranny, what? Of the majority. You, you, <laughs> Right. So, for instance, what if everyone, the majority, you say you have a pure democracy and the majority votes for slavery over and over and over. You can never have any sort of minority interest displayed. So, how does that have to do with the Electoral College? The Electoral College parallels, again, what's supposed to be one of the safeguards, at least in principle, against something like utilitarianism as a moral theory. So, watch this. Let me show you, let me show you why uh this the electoral college is is a good thing well it depends on what side of the aisle you are on, on right now it may be a good thing but let's take this state right here you see what state is this New York. it is solidly what solidly right no doubt about it. i mean you look at it flip and blow it up i mean there it is if you look at the now watch now watch this we click on it now, when you click on this, you think, you what? Oh, everybody in that state agrees. They want that, right? That's, for the most part, generally speaking, what everybody agrees on, right? Watch this. When you click on this, we're looking at the state rights. Result. Now, what we're going to do is you're looking at the county results, right? Does that make sense? Now, look at this state. But what was that state? Solidly what? Blue. But what is it now? Right, right, because of what? What's this right here? This tiny area, New York City, right? So what do you have this? What do you have this urban area doing? Like eight million people in there, and you got a couple. You got a few more million out here. So what do you have this? What do you have this area doing? Dictating what everybody else has to do, right? Now watch this. Let's take another historically. Let's take another historically. Uh, a state decides historically with, with 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 what that would be there, which would be this one right here, smack in the middle, twenty electoral votes right here, solidly, solidly blue, right? And historically, always this, always this, right? It was any other way, that's right? That's Illinois, where Chicago is. Chicago, Illinois. All right, so watch this. It was solidly blue, right? Now check this out. Now, what's right here? Chicago. Chicago. So what do they do? Well, it was Chicago. It's now on fire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what we know in Chicago, now known as New Detroit. Right. Now known as hell. So, but so what, so what do these guys do? They tell, everybody here tells all these guys because, what? Because how they have to live. Because it's all population. Right. So... So, could you imagine living in this state, especially when you never get your view to what? Ever. Your exactly. view's never gotten to be taken seriously because of an urban... Now, I mean, what we could do... Take a look at my home state. Take a look at Florida and you'll see... Oh, I know. Well, it's, it's beautiful. 
it's almost entirely red except for two counties right. are blue and they're my hometown of Miami Dade well, so, and the one north of me. Right. So so again the point is you go to any of these traditionally this and like almost always you've so what's happening is you've got major urban areas that are running the country. So the electoral college this is where I think it would probably and it probably needs to be vamped in some other vamped up a little bit at least. But for at least right now, it may be on its back heels, but at least you see what it's doing. You see the usefulness of it now that just like utilitarianism, the, the, one of the flaws is it can't protect the interests of anyone else that happens to be in a minority view. You see how the ingenious foresight of the founding fathers is these guys right here who were constantly always overwhelmed. Even though this, this little spot is what's telling you how the electoral college gave everybody else here what? A voice. Yeah. You see why that's important? Yeah. And that's almost the, again, the same thing, even here. That there's huge majorities that are never getting the vote voice or if it wouldn't have been for the electoral college. Well no, uh, can I see Florida real no. quick? It's the same thing. I mean it looks almost no, identical to thing I want to see the percentage breakdown of my state because it is it's just those two despite the fact you have major metropolitan areas like they tell them the fact that you have places like Pensacola. Right. Well I mean and this so looks it, this it, looks identical to the this looks almost identical to the 2008 2012 elections. Yeah, this, so this which we, where Florida went solidly 100 percent blue but it looked exactly like this. Yeah. If you if you see it right there in the bottom right yeah. there's at the very far right corner and just above it that's Miami Dade and Broward County. Yeah. And those two are such high population density areas that you can see that it sways despite the rest of it. The percentages are super close at 47.8 and 48.1. Right. Despite the fact the majority of the state being red, the population density is what decided the majority of the vote. All right. So I just wanted to bring that up just because I wanted you to see the parallel between if you think utilitarianism is a bad ethical theory. Because it can't help or ever include anybody that's in, in the interest of a dissenting voice, then you also ought to be a fan of something like, at least in principle, the Electoral College, because it tries to guard against the tyranny of the majority. The problem is nobody likes it when it does what it's when it when it works <laughs> when it does what it's exactly supposed to do, right? Right, because it, it says, wait a minute, majority of people, there's other people here too that have different views than you do. And again, this works both ways, right? That's, right. Both sides are, are, electoral college doesn't pick sides, right? Just like that particular, all right, so now, let's get on to ethical theory. All right, so where are we up to? We're up to divine command theory. So we're gonna talk about this under deontological type ethic, why? Because we just one, we just talked about deontology, right? Kant's deontological ethic. Now, why are we also talking about this under that? One reason, because we just got through talking about it. But what's a more principled reason? Does anybody know? Does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> because divine command theory is a deontological type ethic, right? Now, you're one of the things. Now, in interest of full disclosure, necessarily a divine command theorist. So I don't want you to think that, you know, when I point out, you know, some pro just like any of the other theories, I don't want you to think I'm pointing them out just because I don't think the theory works. I don't want to be fair to the theory, even though I'm not necessarily speaking. Uh, a proponent of this particular ethical theory, um, but I do think it has some very interesting concepts that need to be taken seriously. Where as to where some of the others, I don't even. It looks like even in principle they don't have a, a good answer for. But again, having said that, I'm not necessarily a <clears throat> full-blown divine command theorist by any stretch of the word. Now, what is divine command theory? Well, that might be some sort of principle under it, right? But what is it as a whole? 
again, <laughs> under there. <laughs> yeah, maybe not that, but. <laughs> that would be some kind of goofy pantheism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be try to kill you at every waking moment of the day. <laughs> Send asteroids. <laughs> right. All right. So, in fact, have you seen that? I'm not a big Neil Tyson DeGrasse fan or whatever, but have you seen that? <laughs> All right. So, look, here's what it is. And I had to make a bunch of notes for this because it's easy to just to get off on all kinds of different tangents of divine command theory. So I had to at least set something to keep me in, in some sort of order. So as an overview, this is divine command theory. Divine command theory is a deontological theory that usually piggybacks on another system of ethics like Kantian deontology, natural law, something like that, with additional emphasis on what? God's willing of revelatory commands, right? Something like that. However, it's also sometimes treated as generally even especially more so now treated as a meta ethical theory so what did we talk about when we talk about meta ethics uh, what was the grounding stuff right was meta metaphysics meta ethics that that's really that whole grounding what issue right like what grounds the right the good or whatever right so that's really one of the things that tries to really, really speak to. So that's why, technically speaking, divine command theory piggybacks on top of, say, whatever your other favorite eth eth ethical theory may be, right? Does that make sense? Somebody explain that back. Shoot it back to me in your own words. I want to see if you're on, on the same page there. Not that at all. In fact, put down the vodka. <laughs> you can't pose you. So what is? So what do you? So what do you? Honestly, shoot it back to me. What do you think that that's saying? What do you think that's saying? Because your book, again, kind of frustratingly, just immediately dismisses divine command theory when it's one of the more popular resurgent ethical theories, and it, it dismisses it with one of our objections that we'll get to. That we'll talk about, and we've already talked about this specific objection. But we'll talk about it again. What is what is divine command theory in your own words? Yeah, that and or that what tries to what solve what or met or ground the grounding problem, right? That there's some sort of true obligatory force there, right? It's not just you're not being rational or something. It's not just you that's if you have. Right. Well, they all try to do that, right? They all try to perform, because remember, normative, that's right, what you ought to do. All theory, all these ethical theories, aside from moral relativism, are, are normative and more prescriptive, right? This tries to say, tries to ground it in, tries to fix the metaphysical issue of the grounding, right? That there's a, not only that you ought to behave a certain way, but this tries to give you a real, a solidified reason as to why you ought to behave that way, right? You have to be just like the, the letter G. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You need that a lot. So, uh, so and I'm, I'm not else. I wonder why I do that. It must be some sort of psychological something. Maybe I got punched in the face by the letter V, you know, the Sesame Street thing, yeah. the letter V. All right. So, not only is it normal prescriptive, just like the other ethical theories, but what? Yeah. But what? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all don't y'all didn't grow up on Sesame Street? We did. I did. Today I this episode is brought to you by the letter V. I didn't have PTSD after <laughs> 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 well, I did. <laughs> Alright, so look, this is what this does. Now, what do you think some of the appeals of a divine type of command theory is gonna be? Yeah. Right, that's one of that I wrote down is what? Is it's extremely attractive to religious observers, right? Right. Why might that be be, uh, be the case? Aside from obvious reasons, why might that be the it's case? Just, it's just <laughs> you know, that automatically gets certain people going. Man, they think triggered. So honestly, what what might be some of the appeals of that? Aside from it's attractive to religious observers. What one? Why do you think it might be immediately attractable, attractive to? Because they immediately see that what? 
that it seems immediately to support their view, right? I mean, immediately. I mean, you know, you're, say your typical religious person is not going to say, Immanuel Kant, oh, I bet he's supportive of uh, theistic ethics. Like, they don't know that, but they'll probably immediately assume this, right? Divine command theory, right? Something like that. Um, which, which, which line? Well, I don't know who Manuel Kant is, but I'll tell you what, Maura. All right, so. Well, that's because it's natural. I already have like this built in, like, accent already. Well, you can do the British accent if you really want Yeah. Did you know that the British accent is more. This is the funny thing. further from the original than we are. Well, no, no, no. I was going to say the British accent is more relatable to the Southern accent than any other American accent. It's closer in linkage. Isn't that funny? That is really weird. In fact, you, like, if you grew up in the South, one of the words you hear all the time is reckon, right? Like, well, I reckon that. And what's, you know where that's still used constantly? In England, constantly. And in Scotland. In Scotland and England, that word is still used just like it is used in the South. Like, but here, obviously, it, it, it has been saddled with the baggage of being quote unquote redneck, right? But right. there it's Where's still used and it's sophisticated, right? Isn't that funny? But again, that just shows you the deep roots between the two dialects, the southern dialect. Oh, and the I got my shotgun, I got my beer. Yeah. Well what what aggravates me on movies is when someone tries to do a southern accent on movies because it's so unbelievably exaggerated to the extreme. Like I, like, like Yeah. Well oh. he's he's not really <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not. His is not even one of the worst. I mean, when they're like, "Hey, man, don't you get your butt over here and get this done?" And even I'm here, I'm like, "God, where is that guy? I don't know anybody that sounds like that." Like, what is wrong? Like, I'm from I'm from Georgia. And I don't even know anyone that talks like that guy. Like, yeah. Is that good, by the way? What is that good? I've heard it was good. Pretty good. But Andrew Garfield has got such a thick southern accent in it, but you can tell like some some of his words yes. kind of spew out. It's like that that does not sound right. Or like the new Doctor Strange movie. Benedict Cumberbatch kind of slides on some of his words. All right, so enough irrelevant stuff. Oh, no. So what's another appeal of this? What's another appeal of divine command theory? No, well, maybe. It's another appeal. <laughs> yeah. All right. So one of the things that I have here, one of the appeals, is it seems to align with what common intuition that laws have what. Even more, just more basic than that. It seems to align with the common intuition that laws have what. If you're driving down the road, there's some sort of law, or there's some sort of rule that there's there's what but what behind, what stands behind that. Less abstract than that, Piper. Less abstract than authority. The common intuition that laws, that real, true laws, have what? Lawgivers, right? That if there is some sort of, it seems to appeal to, to the common intuition, well, that if I do have some sort of real moral obligation to follow some real rule, then someone gave that rule, right? As opposed to the opposite of, well, if I have some sort of obligation to some real rule, no one gave that role. It's just kind of there floating by itself. You see what I'm saying? Why it's more intuitive. I'm not saying it's correct at this point. We're just saying it's more intuitive to think that if I have a real moral obligation to a real moral law, to a real rule, well, then somebody, what? Said that. Somebody put that into effect as opposed to it just floating around by itself. You know, like, if, for instance, if you walked into the woods and you saw written on the tree trunk, you know, don't litter, no littering zone or whatever, you would intuitively think that what? Somebody, Somebody put that there. That, that's a real rule backed by some real person. But what if you came to find out, what if you came to find out that, that say, by chance and erosion or whatever the case may be, that it would just happen to be by accident that that bark said that? Do you feel like you have any obligation to that at all now? Now, maybe you have some other reason why you don't want to litter, right? 
but you don't think, well, I shouldn't litter because that says that. Why? There's nobody behind that. That just happened, right? It just was, it was a chance. It was accidental byproduct of nature of some sort. Like, like, oh, well, I mean, even that would assume, presuppose that somebody said it, right? I mean, it wouldn't even come out of just nowhere, right? Right, does that make sense? Now, let's talk about some objections. Let's talk about the first and most common before. Now, the first, I don't think is a good, I think it's an interesting objection, but I don't think it's a good objection. I think the second objection is very good. In fact, it's one of my own objections to, in fact, that's what makes it very good is it's one of my own objections. I'm just kidding. But one of the second objections I think is a very good objection. And it's, again, personally, one of my own objections to divine command theory as a total, as a total theory, as a total ethical theory, right? It's kind of like when we said utilitarianism is a very bad ethical theory in its entirety, right? Meaning that if the axiom is the greatest good for the greatest or the greatest pleasure, the greatest pleasure for the greatest good, well, then that leads to all kinds of crazy complications. But we're not saying that you shouldn't take consequences into effect, right? We're not, nobody's saying that. We're just saying you can't base your, if you're not a utilitarian, we're just saying that you can't base your entire ethical theory off that because it leads to craziness, right? Even things that we would see as evil, lack of better words there, right? Right, so now I think the second objection, though not quite as dramatic or drastic as that, still shows that divine command theory by itself is untenable by itself as a total system. And that's an objection that I share as well, and we'll get to that. But the first is the, is the classic objection, very interesting objection, but I don't think works. In fact, most uh, uh, philosophers of religion have kind of, I mean, they may bring this up as, as an interesting exercise in philosophical history, but realize there's more to DCT or divine command theory than what this objection allows. But again, like we've said, your book throws this out as if it's the end all be all. You remember, we've already talked about it when we were talking about moral arguments for the for theism and whatnot. Does anybody remember what this argument may be? The most famous classic example against divine command theory? Euthyphro dilemma, right? What was the Euthyphro dilemma? Who is Euthyphro? <laughs> Remember when Plato was having a dialogue with somebody? Right? And the other guy is Euthyphro. <laughs> Euthyphro. Right? So what is the Euthyphro dilemma? Piper, you should know this. Yeah, this is the... Okay, I think I remember this one. This is the if he knows or doesn't know. Which one's better for him? No, I mean, you kind of, at least somewhere in the ballpark. All right, so here's the Euthyphro Dilemma. The Euthyphro Dilemma, and when I say it, you'll immediately recognize it from our moral arguments. The Euthyphro Dilemma is, is that which is good, is it good because God says it is? Or does God agree when he sees something good that it's good, that he calls something good because it is good? Oh, I don't remember you putting the word Euthyphro Dilemma. Well, that's what it's called. I just wrote down the limit. <laughs> We, we put the wheels on the cars, we go. Yeah. So the Euthyphro Dilemma is, is that which is good, is it good because God says so, or is it good because God recognizes it as good and calls it good? Right? Well, you got kind of one of those, right? Kind of. Now, what would be the problem with something being good because God says it's good? For instance, let's give a specific example. Right. Is murder wrong? We're kind of doing the reverse here. Is murder wrong because God says it's wrong? What seems to be the problem with that? If that's... If that's it sounds arbitrary. Right, it's arbitrary because if, if murder's wrong because God says it's wrong, well, then God could just do what? Hey, murder good. He just said, right, he just said, murder. murder everybody, do right? It. And then it would be what? The good thing, right, which seems... Seriously, arbitrary. What do we mean by arbitrary? 
Meaning there's no real distinction between right and wrong. It's just whatever God says. In the same sense that it would be like in England and, you know, in, your, in old English colonies, you drive on the left side of the road as opposed to the right side of the road, right? And here we drive on the right side of the road as opposed to the left side of the road, right? So it would be literally like that. Well, God could just drive on this side of the road and everybody would do that instead, right? So that doesn't seem to make God really moral in any sense of the word other than some sort of arbitrary stance, right? Now, the other horn of the supposed dilemma is that is are things good because God recognizes them as good? And so, therefore, yeah, that's good. That what well, seems to be the problem there? The right, that God himself is recognizing some standard that is independent of him. Now, why is that a problem for theism? Right. Well, well, it would mean if God is supposed to be, if classically defined, if God is supposed to be the end all be all, right? Then how can it be possible that there's some standard outside and independent and even in some way above God? No, there's no paradox there. There's no contradiction. It's just not acceptable to what? Say so modern, you know, to, to Judaism, uh, Islam, or Christianity, or any sort of ultimate theism. That's not acceptable. Why? Because God's supposed to be the right. God is just supposed to be the end all, be all. There's not supposed to be anything that's independent of God or over God in any shape, form, or fashion. Now, it could be argued that so Plato, Plato and, and and some of those guys. I think they put a little too much emphasis that they accepted the Greek gods because even even uh, even Socrates seemed to have this belief in this ultimate sort of deities apart from just you know these you know freaking you know Zeus and Apollo running around and smacking each other in the fanny or whatever. And even Plato seemed to have that, and certainly Aristotle did. You know, certainly Aristotle argued for uh, a necessary existence, meaning something that's not finite or contingent. Yeah. The ancient Greeks would have settled on what they would have been fine with what? Well, not the ancient Greek philosophers, but supposedly the laymen. They would have at least been fine with, oh, yeah, you know, all right, the gods recognize the good, right? In fact, this is what we see in some of the ancient Greek tragedies, you know. Uh, what is the name of it? Uh, it's right on the tip of my social. Yeah. There you go. That's exactly right. We see her where she says, you remember her, her, is it her brothers? They die in battle or whatever, and they're in the law of the land is they can't be buried. And she says, there's a law that goes above your law. There's a law that goes above the gods, and it's, it's right or wrong according to that. I'm not Even if it, you kill me or the gods kill me, I'm doing what's right here. She's appealing to what? Some standard over and above whatever else, whether it be earthly or even heavenly, right? Um, that's an awesome play, by the way. You need to read that if you have it. Um, in fact, natural law theorists, theorists will gobble that kind of stuff up. They love that. They use that to show to, to help argue for their view. But anyway, aside from that, it's not helpful to any sort of traditional type of theistic belief, right? Because, again, on one hand, morality is completely arbitrary, or on the other hand, there's some standard independent outside of God. Now, what has been the response to that for Never. Yeah, for a very long time? Because remember, what does a dilemma try to do? A dilemma starts off with a disjunct, right? Let's get back to logic. It starts off with an either-or statement, which is what? Slash or. Either this is true or this is true. Either this or that. It starts off with this as, as its foundation, right? Then it moves from an either-or. And it's supposed to create a dilemma, it has to be either A or what? B. No, not A or B, A or not A. Right? That's a true contradiction, right? You either got this or you got this. Either you're wet or you're not. Right. You want to make to make this strong, it has to be a true disjunct, right? Stay on, stay with me. But then it moves from an either or to what? If then, right? If then. Just stay with me. If, then. 
You, I mean, you do these all the time by yourself. You don't have to have a logic course to know this. Like you do these. You'll say something like, look, man, either we're going to this place or this way. So if we go here, then this. If we go here, then this. But either way, blah, blah, blah. You see, you do that all the time. You should know you're doing it. You didn't know there were rules to it, right? This, this is just a disjunctive. It starts off with a disjunctive syllogism, combines it with a hypothetical or a modus ponens or modus tonus type argument, and it gives you a dilemma, right? It's a form of argument. Now, the, the strength of your dilemma is that it really is supposed to put you on what? Two horns, right? This horn or this horn, right? It's supposed to put you on the horns of a dilemma. You don't have another option. Either you've got A or not A, right? Now, how do you get out of a dilemma? One way to do that is it's called you split the horns of the dilemma. Which is also known as out. A, not A, or B. You just have a logically possible what? Third alternative. In fact, this is how most of the time you do what? Cop out. No, not cop out, but this is how in your normal life you would do what most of the time? It's how you would escape a dilemma that your friend offers up nine times out of ten. Right, you would just say, Well, you said if we go to Kmart and this, or you said and then if we go to Walmart and this, but hey man, we could go to Target. You see what I'm saying? Like, you, you almost all the way, almost every time you get out of a dilemma in conversation with friends, you just show, Wait a minute, man, you're not, you haven't exhausted all the possibilities. Yeah, Wait, where is this magical place? Yeah. That it's died. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, you just basically what you're doing is you're, you're just showing your friend that they haven't what. Exhausted all the possibilities. You've just shown them that they haven't what? <laughs> they haven't thought about it. You've just shown them that they haven't get, they haven't exhausted all the possibilities. There's just other possibilities, right? Because if that's true, then what is this? It's just a false dilemma. It means there's not really a dilemma there. There's just this other possibility, right? Does this even have to be true? Does your third option even have to be true? No, it just has to exist. Right, it just has to be, well, it, not just, it has to be at least possible, logically possible. It can't be something like, well, dude, what about married bachelors? Right, it can't be something incoherent. It has to be logically possible. You're, one of the, you're, you're a spouse that doesn't decide on where you can. <laughs> yes and no, we'll have to talk about that after class. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think you'd like my answer. Or you can you can show that one of these isn't true, right? You can show if there's all kinds of ways you get out of the dilemma. The most common way is this. In fact, this is the most common way that the youth of dilemma has been what? Circumvented. Right. Does anybody think that what is that? Does anybody know? With circumvent? Cop out. <laughs> <laughs> what does anybody does anybody know the third option here? What's the two options? <laughs> well, you know the two options, right? Either, either morality is arbitrary because God just declares stuff just by his fiat, what is right or wrong, or God has to recognize some standard outside of himself. Yep. What is it? Think about it. That God is morality. Well, kind of close to that. Because there's two ways to answer this. You've got. What, what are called theistic personalists that would use more like this answer, then you've got, uh, again, say something like Aristotle's type answer that would fall into the other, a different category, but they would all Well, they would say this, the theistic personalists, because this is the easiest to understand what I offer off of that, somebody like Weimar and Craig would offer. They'll say, look, man, God issues commands in accord with what? What would they say? What would they say? Huh? God issue, issues commands in accord with what? His own nature. Meaning that God himself is the standard of morality, right? His nature is the standard of morality. So when he issues his commands, it's not arbitrary. Why? Because he can't go against, when we talk about what omnipotence entails, all those things about it can't be logically impossible. Yeah, he can't go against Trump. <laughs> Well, God can't go against his nature. It's logically impossible for God to go against his nature, right? Because then he wouldn't be God by definition. So God commands in accord with his nature, meaning that, quote, on this side, what? The, the, the commands aren't arbitrary because they couldn't be any other way. And there's no independent standard outside of God because God himself, his nature, just what? 
It just is what? The standard, right? It just is the standard. It commands and records to his nature. Now, that would be something like the theistic personalist response. Somebody like, you know, your William Lane Craig or whatever is going to offer that splits on you and says, look, man, like, you just didn't think that through. There's just another option that's possible. Now, another option that's possible is, and this would go something more like the Aristotelian type view, is that God,